welcome to the stage Daniel Dines. He's the co-founder and CEO of UiPath, a leading provider of robotic process automation and AI software worldwide. He founded the company in Romania in 2005. UiPath software performs low-skilled and repetitive tasks, once outsourced to humans in cheaper wage countries, UiPath's client base includes the CIA, the U.S. Navy, McDonald's, and Duracell. And last year, UiPath was valued at $7 billion. And Soma, a managing director at Madrona Venture Group, his focus is on machine learning, artificial intelligence, intelligent applications, developer-centric, next-generation cloud platforms and tools, and the emergence of new technologies. And he only has one one name, that's like a Beyonce. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Uh, good to see you here, Daniel. Likewise. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you and getting a chance to, uh, to have this fun conversation with uh, Daniel. Daniel and I sort of crossed paths uh, probably almost like 15 years ago, without realizing that we were crossing paths at the time because we both were working for the same company back then. And then we got reconnected about uh, a couple of years ago, and it's been a fantastic journey to be a, path, uh, to be, to be a part of UiPath these past few years kind of thing. But like everything else, like you know, people say, like, oh my god, what a successful story this is. It's an overnight success. Nothing is an overnight success. It takes time, right? And particularly if you look at uh, the UiPath history, it's, it's been a, a fascinating, uh, fascinating journey. Company started out of Romania, and uh, for the first 10 uh, years, uh, if you have to be honest, I would say they were sort of you know, limping along. And then things changed, and uh, it went on a hyper growth path, whereby it's now one of the fastest growing enterprise companies in the history. That's a fascinating journey. Why don't you tell us in your own words, like you know, what the journey looked like for you? Well, it's uh, it's definitely it's been a long, full of hardship journey. And let me start with the beginning. I uh, I studied uh, math and computer science in Bucharest, Romania, which fortunately for me was still back then a country where focused a lot on education and math. You know, in Eastern Europe was always kind of the queen of science. And I was, again, fortunate enough to get a job offer from Microsoft really early in my career. I went to work in uh, Bellevue, Washington, for five years. I worked in a great product group called SQL Server back then. And of course, I always used Visual Studio, so I was a big fan of Soma Thank you. all my career. But, uh, you know, I, uh, for, for someone coming uh, at, like, in, in his 20s to US from Europe, was a bit challenging for me to adapt to the, to the style. Even though, professionally speaking, the experience in Microsoft was great. And it uh, taught me how to build, you know, a large distributed system. So I, I had a lot of good learnings. But I had the crazy idea to go back and start a company. And that was really before the uprising of the, you know, kind of venture capital 2005, 2006 in the Bay Area. So I didn't know anything. So didn't know anything about what, what is a lean startup, you know, fail fast. So I went back and I've done all the mistakes imaginable, really. But also lots of learnings. And somehow we ended up building this computer vision technology that uh, was the only light in this journey. So to give you a sense how we started, because it's, I, I think it's, you know, luck is a very big part in, in, in our journey, and I think in everybody's journey. We've started building a very small tool, like a dictionary tool that you install an add-on on your computer, and you will click on the word, and then we'll capture the word behind the mouse cursor and show like definition of the word, or search it on Google, or something like this. So this tool was a flop, really, is, but lots of learnings, marketing, you know, even drafting the legal agreement. You, you have to learn. 
But the technology behind, so basically seeing where all the text are on a computer screen, proved to be a lot more challenging to build than we thought originally. And we found our first customers buying this technology from us. So then next 10 years, we, uh, we've started to improve on it. And we've become like a SDK company, an OEM type of company, selling this to different, but it was, we, eventually I and a few guys that you know started this company, we built a, a lifestyle business, which was kind of the, a dead end to my career. Like around 2012, I really thought I am, I am really a dead man. Nobody, I'm unemployable because I kind of lost my programming skill or a bit rusty. I was not an operator, not a manager, so I knew a bit of everything. Who would hire such a guy? So, and uh, really, when we were just about to kind of close the, you know, the court in and call it a day, we got our first real enterprise customer. It was, uh, it was a company based out of Chennai, a BPO company, coming to us and saying, uh, it's, we are doing a pilot with one of your competitors, and we would like to try your software too. Back then, I didn't know who this competitor was. If you believe me, I didn't even know what BPO is, business process outsourcing. In my mind, as a technologist, as an engineer, I thought, all this system should work well together. Big companies, big banks, with so billions in investment in IT, how come they still have a lot of manual work? But that's the reality on the field. And starting from that day, we, uh, three of my best people, which were like 30% of the company, went to Chennai. They spent there almost three months building the technology. And, uh, We've seen, this is a big market. And since then, we, it, it's important, we just had one opportunity. But we went big for this opportunity. And since that moment, we got into raising money. Our first round took a lot of time, like almost, you know, six, 18 months to raise, but then everything has accelerated. But first 10 years was a complete, uh, really hardship. Got it. That, that's always fascinating. Like, you, know, you go for 10 years and you're sort of limping along, limping along, have many near-death experiences, and then something changes in either the industry or in terms of how you get access to customers, and then boom, you're off to a sort of you know, fantastic start kind of thing. Uh, but before we go further down that journey, can you spend a few minutes talking about what does UiPath do today? Yeah. Um, during, during the years, I tried in many ways to express this. This is one of the most difficult things for us to express what we are doing. And uh, so, when you when you do, you know, a task, an activity, most of us use computers to carry on activities. So when when we use computers, we basically use type and click on the screen. We can, from a very high level, we can, uh, we can cipher what we are doing in a very few movements. So we learned this, you know, long time ago, how to use the mouse, the keyboard. We identify, if I have to fill up a form, I just go, where is my first name, last name, address, phone number. So I identify fields, click on them, type. It comes very natural to us. And somehow we feel that this is a human-like task. But imagine that there is a, an other application, like a software brain, that can do the same to applications. It doesn't have to be physical. Works inside the computer and simulates mouse and keyboard. But the key is to look at the screen and understand the screen like a human user. And this is, this is what our software does. It, able, it is able to emulate humans in how they do a process. Of course, you have to, you have, when you do an activity, you can split this, the activity in a few steps. So if you buy something online, you go to, you know, to a merchant site and then you enter, search for, enter the order, you know, enter credit card press, okay. These are the steps. 
we can teach these steps to our technology and they will be able to replicate it like, like a human user. And we, uh, we are able to understand if there are slight changes to the user interface, we are able to cope with this, exactly like a human user. I think one of the closest technology to what we are doing is the one that powers self-driving cars. Mm. What is saying based on a car go from A to B. A car follows the, you know, a route, well-defined route on the map. But following this route puts a lot of challenges. Understanding the other cars in front of you, crossroads, lights, stopping, accelerating. This is basically, we are using kind of the same approach, but driving applications, various applications, in order to fulfill a business process. That's great. You know, like five years ago, I, I, I don't think I, heard, I had heard the terminology or the word robotic process automation. And today it's like, you know, hey, everybody talks about it, you know, particularly in, a, in, a, in an era of digital transformation, right? Today you talk to uh, CEOs and CIOs, and most of these people will tell you that, like, hey, one of my top two priorities is digital transformation. Every company today, no matter what industry or what services you are delivering, you think about yourself as a technology company. So in this day and age, where digital transformation is something that every enterprise is thinking about, what do you think the role of UI path is, particularly as you think about automating business workflows and business processes? What do you think UI path's role is in helping enterprise customers along this digital transformation journey? Well, nowadays, uh, I think uh, most of the enterprises and the uh, big SIs agree that robotic process uh, automation is the first natural step into a big digital transformation initiative. And, uh, but we think that we can go way higher than, uh, than just being the first step. Because we enter you know, the history through a very through a derided technology called screen scraping in the days. We evolved, we evolved this technology to actually be more efficient than any other automation, traditional automation mean. And we play, we play an end-to-end -end automation uh, platform. So we, 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 we started from RDA, but now we have a full end-to-end -end automation product. So we believe that in the, in the, in the future for a, co a company, we'll build their entire operations on the top of our platform. So, so you go from like sort of, you know, hey, let me automate some workflows to building a full-fledged automation platform. Okay. Yes. So. And then if I, and, and part of it is because like, you know, hey, there's been a, a tremendous amount of advances in the technology space, whether it is cloud computing, so you have like, you know, a ton of computing resources available to you, or a lot of advances in ML and AI, particularly as it relates to document understanding and computer vision. And all these technologies come together to help you uh, take advantage of and build this hyper automation platform kind of thing, right? But if you project forward and look into the future, say five years from now, where do you see UiPath heading? What, what, what would you say your vision for UiPath is? For, and, uh, I think someone said like, hey, next 10 years, a lot of great things are gonna happen. Where do you see UiPath in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, to to take one of the points about with AI and the scalability, and it, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult to scale AI today. And I think automation, and particularly our technology, is really well suitable to scale AI. So we believe that we can actually be a ramp to deliver large-scale AI into the enterprises. So I'll, I can give you an, an example how, how actually automation can scale AI. Let's, let's take uh, a simple process like the one to, to deposit a check. Mm -hmm. like how do you do today? You have a mob mobile application, you know, take a picture of the check and then someone in the back office will look at, check the, you know, verify if the, if the check is legit. And there are many steps into this process. One of the steps is to really check if the signature, the endorsement, on the back of the check, kind of is the same 
It's valid. It's, so you have basically two endorsements, one on the front and one on the back. Our technology today is not able to look at two signatures and validate if they come from the same person. This is, this is difficult. This is hardcore AI to build this. But any other steps we are able to, we are able to automate. Now, if we, if, we, uh, if we take back you know, this discussion, and let's see a great, a great AI company build and build a machine learning model that takes as an input two signatures and they, they will produce, they say yes or no. Who is going to use it? Nobody. But you know why nobody? Because it takes only two seconds of a 10 minutes process. The, the re what business, a business doesn't care if I have very nice, sophisticated AI to, to verify to signature. They, what they care is the fulfillment of the check deposit and make sure if you shorter the time and you use less people, they are happy with this. So AI, it's useless completely to them. But now, if we go and we have automated the entire process end to end, and this is one single step that we cannot automate, and we have to do a lot of ping pong, saying, capturing screenshots, sending them to a human user to validate, waiting, and then continue. It's a lot of hassle in between. Now AI becomes way more valuable, and we can deliver it at scale. And this is one example. This signature we can deliver to all processes involving a signature. So we can, you, can, you can make a business out of one. But automation is fundamental. It's a fundamental delivery mechanism for the AI. For AI. That's great. I want to now switch focus, Daniel, a little bit and talk uh, <clears throat> more about uh, leadership and culture. Okay. I should tell you in the last uh, two, three years that I've sort of had a chance to work with you a little more closely, I can tell you that you know, there hasn't been a single all-hands meeting that you've done or a single board meeting that I've been participating with you where you don't spend, uh, uh, you spend at least a, a fair chunk of your time and energy on talking about leadership principles, on talking about culture, cultural values, and how you want to uh, set the culture for the organization. Tell me about that. Tell me a little bit about that, and particularly like if there are some specific examples you can talk about, either in terms of like you know, the kinds of values that are important to you that you want UiPath to have, or how do you go about like you know, building that culture that I think would be would be fascinating to hear. I think the best is to to give you a perspective of uh, of our history in terms of culture, how we ended up with our culture today. Well, around 2015, uh, you know, we knew this is going to scale. All the signs were there. And uh, I recognized that we are not really operators. We are just a bunch of software engineers. So we are on the verge of hiring a lot more people from different domains. And a big ask was, how can we, first of all, what is the culture? Because first of all, Initial startups, I think maybe up to 100 people, you cannot talk about the culture because everybody knows each other. It's like a family. I don't think a family has a culture or you can talk. So it's, uh, but, but we talk constantly about what the culture is. Netflix was a big inspiration for us, how they look at the culture. And we ended up with, you know, defining the culture through many values and behavior and you know, first of all, we wanted to say we are very open. So it took a lot of, you know, pride in saying we are really open. And, and then other people come, but we, sh we are diverse, we are transparent, we are honest, we are hardworking. And you can end up, you know, when you do, when you do a debate about what is culture, what defines you, I think you will end up with a large set of values. So the biggest challenge to me was at that point to how can how can find something that doesn't dilute us and in the end will be you know an empty word but also define us. And I um, I went to do this exercise. Let's define our culture by one single value. What's the most if I have to choose one? 
And then again, looking back to our roots, how can, you know, you know, a bunch of engineers, and honestly, not really rock star engineers, a bunch of engineers, but very passionate about what they've done, from Eastern Europe, from a small apartment, how can we merge there? You know, I realized one of the, one of, it was kind of in, con our, our competitors were arrogant. This, this competitor that we talked, you know, that we compete with in India, they were arrogant. Otherwise, I was, otherwise their customer wouldn't search. So it was, they were so arrogant that a mi someone in middle management searched on the internet a competitor mm -hmm. just to get rid of them because they couldn't stand a company that is inflexible, it's arrogant, doesn't. So I, then I realized we are here because we were humble. And we were humble and we work with customers that the first chance we just went there. This customer, this, our first customer told us, you come, I'll pay you at cost. I say yes. And we went and we went for cost, but we discovered a big market. And then I put, I said really, it's hum being humble. And then thinking more about what, what does it mean to be humble. I discovered this is more, this is not a value. This is a framework. This is a framework of how you should think your culture. Because if you are humble, first of all, you are more open to listen to others. You are more open to change your mind. Changing a mind, I think it's one of the most important traits one can aspire to. Because you have more data, change your mind. People don't change, your, don't change their mind because they have this kind of cocky position you know, I have to be consistent. You don't have to be consistent. You have to be, you have to be smart. Don't, don't fear of losing faith. So this is why, and when, so this is why I'm pushing and pushing and say, it's, hum, being humble is not an intrinsic value. We are not born humble. On the contrary, I think we are born pretty arrogant. Life humbles us a bit. And, uh, also, even to pretend I am humble, it's not a sign of being humble. So this is why humble, it's a framework you have to aspire to, but it's, a, it's like a muscle. We have to work on it every day. Because if you don't work on it, you'll lose it. So this is how, this is, and it kind of guided us a bit, because we were able to hire 3,000 people in the span of four years. And we, the most important thing is we kind of avoided arrogant assholes in this process. <laughs> and they kill companies. Got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I, you know, talk, as an extension to this uh, you know, conversation about culture and leadership, right? One thing that fascinated me about uh, UiPath is, is that almost from day one, you really built it as a as a truly global company. Right? Everybody says like, you know, hey, we are all global companies, and but it's a, it's a usually a sequential step in the journey, right? I'll first worry about my local market, and then I'll think about the next, you know, uh, most important market, and then sort of work my way down, kind of thing. And uh, without going into specifics, UiPath's revenues today, a third comes from Asia, a third comes from, or Asia Pacific, I, I should say, a third comes from Europe. A third comes from North America. Very, very few companies at your stage have that kind of a geographic distribution. That's on the one hand. Yeah. The other hand is you really have like sort of teams of people, large teams of people around the world. How did you think about like you know building a global company from day one, and uh, how was that journey like? I think we, we were uh, we were pretty lucky to start the company in a small in a small country. So we've never sold in the Romanian market. We always sold across the globe. And uh, that shaped a bit our very more international uh, appetite to, to go for. In, uh, I think in US and Bay Area, most of the companies, this is the playbook. They start in US, they 
they say we will uh, perfect our business model or play business and then we will cascade, you know, for all the world. To me, it's kind of wrong. We, we move beyond this approach because you can really start global from day one and we prove it. We have all the, you know, infrastructure and technology to start global. There is, it's a lot of appetite in Asia really for consuming technology. I was really surprised. Mm. Even China today, we, I think we are probably the first enterprise software in history that is able to build a Chinese business without the JV. So we are wholly on subsidiary, but we still, it's a good business that is going there. Japan, it's a fantastic business to us. Second country after US in terms of revenue. So, and, and our model was, it's, we, don't have, we don't have a business model. Like, we don't have anything to figure. In the beginning, let's just go conquer territories, conquer as much, as much as we can, and then we will figure it out later. And again, I think that it's wrong to come to build a business model in US and try to apply it in Europe and Asia. It's, they are very different markets. It's locality in these markets, particularly in enterprise software, is very important. So that was, uh, to us, it, it helped that we understood a lot of, you know, what, what does it mean to respect other culture, you know, not come with, you know, being a superiority, you know, approach to this. And it, our customers uh, love us, and they really want to work with us. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience so people can start thinking about if you have any questions for Daniel. But last year, 2019, was a, was a, was a, I would say a landmark year for UiPath on a couple different dimensions. Okay? Uh, on the one hand, you did accomplish the $7 billion valuation milestone, which was fantastic given like, you know, the journey that you went through the last four years or five years kind of thing. Uh, we publicly announced last year that like, hey, we've hit the $300 million ARR revenue milestone, which was also again a, a fantastic milestone. We are one of the fastest growing, if not like the fastest growing enterprise software company. But having all these sort of positive accomplishments on one end, towards the end of last year, we had to do uh, some course corrections in UiPath uh, for a variety of good reasons kind of thing. Can you shed some context and color and light on like, you know, hey, what happened and why did that happen? Yeah, I think we should go back to 2018. Okay. And even more into 2017, October. Okay. So we were, we were at a board meeting and you are not at that time in the company. And our business in October 17 was about uh, 20, $22 million ARR, recurring revenue business. And I knew it's coming, Q4, it's always big for us. I knew it's coming a big year to us. And then I went to, I went to the board and I told them, next year I plan to make $200 million. They looked to me like an alien. Said, and literally, and you know them, you know, Luciana yeah. said, Daniel, if you make 70 million, we are happy. But my, my, uh, my mouth was a bit different. I said, we are number three in the market today. And that's, this is where we, where we, my competitors will probably go in 2010 roughly towards 100 million in, in recurring revenue. If this technology is going mainstream and this is gonna be a big market, this is our chance to leapfrog them and go much higher. And we know, if, if we go to 200, we will put a serious distance ahead of our competitor and we conquer a huge market. So it doesn't matter. So I didn't want to build a nice, small, well-built company back then. I wanted to, to go for the kill. And then we started to, I went to, I went to our sales leader. They had the same reaction, Daniel, you are crazy. But then I told him, yes, let's, try to triangulate, pipeline, how many sales people need, what sales productivity, let's try to, let's try to build a plan. And 
After, you know, some reflection, they came to me saying, I think we are pretty confident we can get to 150. I said, okay, guys, it's good. Let's build a, let's build a company that take us to 200. Worst case scenario, we'll get to 150. That's good. 2018, we hit 170 million in, uh, in ARR and 190 million in billings. So we, we achieve our mission. 2019, we scored number one by all the analysts, entire market. Now, naturally, I tried to repeat in 2019. So in 2019, I said, yes, let's make a plan to hit $600 million. So it was kind of an enthusiast this time. Everybody said, yes, it's possible. But the market was not there for $600 million. The market was there for $430 million that, that we, we had in 2019, which is still fantastic because growing from kind of 190 to 430 in billings and, three, and 170 in ARR to 360, it's almost unheard of. I know only one company that you also are on the board that was able to do this. But I don't want to, I don't, I, I really, I, I feel that, again, speaking about being humble, we should course correct when we have the data around July, August, we started to get the data. Q1 was not bad, Q2 was not bad, but Q3 didn't go where we wanted. So we understood we oversized the company. And actually in this exuberance, it was a lot of unnecessary roles that were created, overlapping. So we, we really took this opportunity and look really deeply into our court. And, you know, we, we've done a big rework that it was, we ended up, you know, laying off 10% of our, of our workforce, but in a great conditions for them. And we have improved the culture, our agility, our position, and we score a great Q4. And then our prospects are good. I think it was a, it, it was a sign of strength in the end. That's great. That, that's a, that's a, a pretty honest, uh, honest articulation of what happened there, Daniel. So thank you. Let me now open it up uh, to the audience, if, see if people have any questions for Daniel. Back there. You said you wanted to maintain a culture of humility. Um, you indicated that you wanted to maintain a culture of humility. Uh, did you have a bunch of arrogant assholes you need to unload? Or did you maintain that consistency throughout? <laughs> well, I, I don't think we have uh, assholes in the real sense. We try hard to get. But we have people that are kind of stuck in, in the mindset. We have, I think, what is called a frozen middle. We are, our, our middle management can, uh, can be improved a bit. And we always try to measure it. We have even an anonymous feedback channel. So everyone that has an account can go and do, you know, put anonymous comments that everyone can see, which is pretty toxic sometimes. And you will see, but at least let you discover you have some problems. I'm a big believer in prevention versus curing something. So I. I am trying, and we are trying, we, the leadership, trying, we are trying the best, uh, the best of our knowledge to, to keep it alive. But it's not, uh, it's not an easy journey, really. It's, uh, and to this side, you cannot please anyone, for sure. So it's, um, it's, it's a struggle, I would say. And what were, what were the key attributes of the Netflix model uh, that you took to heart and implemented in your company? Well, I liked, uh, particularly in Netflix, I liked the idea that is we, we don't work with average people. We, 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 if we hire average people, we thank them, give them a really good severance package, but we don't want to keep in the company. We are, we, we, and we are, I'm telling people, we are, guys, this is not a nine to five company, this is one in a lifetime company, if you, if you are not able to work in our environment, that's not for you. That's, that's clear, and we always, 
said this. I like a lot the idea of liberty, of giving people, like for travel, you know, do travel as you ex expense as you do, you know, if it's your, it's for your own. And we've tried it in the beginning. We also discovered, unfortunately, it's not working at our scale. <laughs> So some of the Netflix, but it's, it's a good incubator of ideas to start with, to define a culture. Sheila, please. Who are your heroes? My heroes? Well, it's in, a, I'll start, a guy that really shaped my thinking is the founder of Y Combinator, Paul Graham. So I read a lot. So being from Romania, I think he, he did a great thing for, uh, for actually not necessarily for Bay Area, but for all entrepreneurs around, building a bit of an open framework and learning a bit. So I, I would say I, I come from different, my, you know, I studied math. I'm, I like a lot of great mathematicians, you know, novelists, many people. Not necessarily, you know, the, the modern entrepreneurs. I think sometimes that it's the social culture turns a bit people, make the losing a bit their own self somehow. When you tweet too much, I think you lose a bit of, uh, of your senses, really. <laughs> so tweet less. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to yeah. keep it to yourself, yeah. Got it. Any, anybody else? Any last question? Great. We got nine seconds to go. So, Daniel, thank you so much for being here, for taking the time to come out here. Sure. Thank you so much.